Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, very pleased to have um, University of Michigan and um, Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning today. Um, for our workshop today, we have um, our topic is future of urban technology. I hope I can be, I, I'm clear. Um, and um, so I'm going to introduce um, all the panelists for today. And I'm going to start with uh, Brian Boyer, who is the program director at uh, the Urban Technology Program at uh, University of Michigan's Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. Uh, we have Nihal Shetty, who is the country general manager at WeWork India. Um, we have Diana Friend, who is the admissions officer at Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. Thank you everyone for joining us today and I'm going to be your moderator. Uh, my name is Daval Mehta and I'm the founder and CEO of TNI Career Counseling. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you students. Uh, thank you counselors. It's lovely to have you today. And moving on to the next slide, we also have Rahul, Trey, and Deepa who joined us. Um, and um, I would really want to thank them for all the effort that they've put in um, to make sure that this happens. Thank you very much. Um, at TNI Career Counseling, we're a certified global admissions consultant and test preparation venture for undergraduate, masters, and MBA programs in India and abroad. We recognize that planning a career is a family decision and our initial personal one-to-one -one counseling with a parent and child helps identify goals, personality, learning styles, career values, and skill sets to help us guide the higher education outcome over time by advising on areas that need strengthening. We work with all stakeholders to make this possible. Thank you. Deepa, Good evening, would you everybody. Like sure. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us in today. Thank you, Mr. Mehta, for introducing all the panelists. And I would like to introduce Mr. Dhawal Mehta, who is the CEO and founder. So Mr. Dhawal Mehta is an expert career coach who has 17 plus years of experience. He's also a NACAC member, Pearson Certified Career Counselor. Hello, am I audible? Yes, Deepa, please go ahead. He's also uh, an alumni of University of Michigan and uh, yeah, Ann Arbor and Columbia University graduate. Mr. Mehta, I would like you to uh, go ahead, please, and um, start the workshop. Thank you, Deepa. Thank you very much. Um, lovely. So the flow of the workshop for today is uh, 60 minutes. It's about five minutes where I'm providing an introduction um, and setting um, sort of um, a storyline for uh, the flow of the workshop. and. Um, uh, post that, I will pass the um, the baton on to um, Nihal Shetty, who is the country manager uh, for WeWork India. And then um, Brian will take it on from there um, and give an introduction of urban technology um, at University of Michigan. Um, and thereafter, we'll have a sort of a, a project of a problem statement analysis. And then post that, there will be a question and answer session with Brian and Diana. Great. Um, I want to introduce the program for urban technology before we move on. Um, and I want to say urban technology and, and my discussion with Brian, it was very interesting. I thought um, the first time when I spoke to Brian about the program, um, I was, I was, you know, it was incredible. Um, I feel that it's, it's great. It's the need of the hour to combine technology and urban design. Um, and I feel um, my, my conversations have really led me to understand uh, a lot more about how the program's gonna help, um, you know, uh, build careers for many areas, um, including um, UI, UX designer, uh, policy analyst, a product designer. Um, and I feel that's, that's, that's incredible for a bachelor's program. Um, so uh, urban technology is an emerging field at the intersection of technology, urbanism, and design. This is where apps, devices, and organizations are created with the aim of making cities better for all people. The Bachelor's of Science in Urban Technology at the University of Michigan is a first of its kind degree in this dynamic field. Through the program's unique winter start structure, you will begin classes at University of Michigan Ann Arbor campus during the winter term, and you will participate in spring intensive hosted in centers of urban innovation, including the city of Detroit. Um, 
over to you. Um, well, okay, sorry, I'm gonna go to this slide that says, what can you expect uh, from today's session is hearing about urban technology from Brian, um, the curriculum project research work, exciting careers, uh, the problem statement analysis and the life project, um, Q&A with Brian Boyer and Diana Friend. Introducing Nihal. Nihal is again the country manager at WeWork India. He's a graduate of University of Michigan and Nihal has previously held strategic roles in program management at Amazon and Cummins Power Generation. At WeWork, he used to support with strategy planning and forcing alliances. Nihal has now stepped into a new role where he is responsible for handling all the 34 WeWork locations in India. Congratulations, Nihal. Over to you. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Daval, for that. And thank you for setting this up uh, uh, on, for, for all the students out here. I'm very glad to be part of this esteemed panel with this group here. Uh, good evening to all of you. Hope all of you are staying safe in these times. Um, you know, while I'm still getting used to these virtual sessions, I think with time, uh, we're only getting better with this. Um, so I just want to talk about a few things here in, with this group I thought is very relevant to, to, the, to the conversation that we're having today. One was both my experience at Michigan and two, my experience at WeWork. Uh, so my association with the University of Michigan goes back more than a decade. I was a master's student at the Industrial and Operations Engineering Department way back in 20, 20, 2006, 2007. Um, please don't guess my age with that year, but uh, it's been more than a decade with that, right? Uh, before that, when I was doing my undergraduate studies in, in India, I still vividly remember uh, you know, being not very clear with what I wanted to do next. Uh, was it a job? Was it a master's in India? Was it a master's abroad? I had a lot of doubts in my mind. Uh, after speaking to a lot of you know, seniors, family, friends, peers, I thought going abroad and studying in a world-class institute like the University of Michigan would broaden my perspectives in life and that it would, go, it would, it would make it worthwhile uh, you know, in, terms of, in terms of my experiences for the future. Um, as I look back today, I'm, I'm very grateful for having made that decision, right? Uh, because it's, it's, it, it has been a, you know, a very pivotal experience uh, and, a, and a very uh, a big milestone in my journey so far. And it's been primarily for two reasons, right? One was uh, the quality of the education uh, was impeccable, right? Uh, the faculty was world-class. The program was very well structured. It provided options to explore courses from a very different uh, perspective and gave you options to even explore different, fun different departments. For example, I took courses you know, from the Ross School of Business uh, you know, under, under legends like C.K. Prahlad and, and Anil Karnani, who are well known in their fields, right? And, and I couldn't have done that anywhere in the world, right? So um, I think that was, that was uh, uh, an amazing experience for me. And second was the peer group, right? I think the university attracted uh, some of the world's best. And, and so the caliber that you're actually mingling with and learning from and experiencing um, as you go through that you know, course was just amazing and eye-opening for me. And uh, not to say the least, a lot of fun too, right? So it really helped shape uh, who I am today. Um, Post-university, I got a good opportunity to work at a large product management co manufacturing company, which was a very great learning experience and a stepping stone for me in my career. Uh, this was again in the US, right? Uh, fast forward uh, after all these years, my connection with the US has, has gotten reestablished uh, through, my, uh, through my stint at WeWork, right? Uh, so we work as a global uh, leader in, in flexible real estate solutions and was set up in India in 2017, right? So it's almost been three years and we've grown immensely in the country, right? For those of, our, for those of us who are in the system, we've been genuinely surprised by how well enterprises, entrepreneurs and small businesses have embraced the concept of working flexibly. And this is because our workspaces are designed for flexibility and better collaboration, right? We work India is present right now in 34 locations across six cities, and we have over 40,000 members that include globally recognized names like Spotify, Morgan Stanley, HSBC, and the likes. We work is committed to providing members around the world with a better day at work for less. I hope you had a chance to visit our workspaces. You may be aware of various offerings we have for anyone wanting a space to work. With the pandemic, uh, you know, posing a big 
big challenge for companies across the world, including ours. It is important for us to lead the change and offer innovative solutions for changing needs of customer segments, right? And, uh, and in doing so, I'll just share two instances uh, where we've huddled together as a team and come together uh, to come up with some interesting solutions. The first is, is what we call WeWork On Demand. Um, the idea here is that if you can book an Uber with a click of a button and food gets delivered through Swiggy, which is an Indian version of DoorDash, uh, you know, then why not book a workspace? Uh, so, we work around, so we worked around this and we've introduced this product called On Demand where anyone can book a workspace by the day and meeting rooms by the hour as and when one needs it. In a market like India and taking into account the current predicament of the pandemic, this would be a game changer for companies from a work from home regime to a work from anywhere future, right? So we really believe that uh, it's important for us to, to keep and maintain these trends for uh, workspace offerings, workspace design, uh, keeping the global context and the local context in mind. The second uh, instance I wanna talk about is what we call WeWork for Education, right? As now, colleges- Now I just interrupted, you have another one minute to finish. Sure. Then we move on because we are a tight schedule. So. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, as colleges and you know, universities continue to struggle with pandemic era, era challenges, we, we felt that the quest for learning and education should, shouldn't be hindered, right? Once again, I'm super proud to work with, com with companies that have realized the need for students and institutions. And in our, in our unique way, we are building a new experience for students and faculty alike. With WeWork for Education, a combination of our on-demand and all-access products, we are able to create an extended campus for university students and faculties, right? Um, I'll be a little brief here. So WeWork is on a mission to provide flex flexibility to companies to beautifully design workspaces. This is thanks to our amazing quality of designers, architects, and product teams. And we continue to attract such talent through full-time internship programs, right? Um, on that note, I would, I'd like to again thank, you know, Daval and the entire team uh, for this opportunity. And I hope all of you guys are staying safe and support the vulnerable individuals around us. Uh, I wish you guys a good day and I'll, I'll let uh, Brian take over from here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's lovely um, to hear you out. And this is just a short survey or a poll which is being launched just to let everyone know where uh, the students are from. If the students can just quickly, uh, you know, fill it out um, and put their options, it'll be very helpful. The questions that are being asked is where are you joining us from? Uh, which grade are you in on scale of one to five? How are you feeling today? What do you expect to get out of the workshop? Why did you decide to attend this event? And finally, a fun hand on the heart. Are you wearing PJs right now? <laughs> Just wondering how many of us are actually wearing PJs. All right. Okay. Well, I think 73% I can see right now are actually saying that, oh, wow, that's being steady at 73%. Interesting. Yes, we have students for us today who are all at home making themselves comfortable while they're on this webinar. And I'm glad to see that. Thank you. Great. We have another couple of more seconds to it. Guys, you need to speed up. 38, 39. Come on, chop, chop. That's how you're supposed to. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop the poll now. All right, we're getting closer. Okay, I can see those numbers coming in. Yes. Okay, 47. All right, I'm going to end the poll now. Thank you. And I'm going to share the results so that we can all see. Um, we're seeing um, a lot of students from different places. Wow, it's not just the cities. I love that. Um, and we're going to see um, which grade are you in, and it says 11th and 12th. Um, so it's spread between both of them, and then college, there are about four of them. So that's great to see. And on a scale of one to five, how are you feeling today? And we're actually seeing four, so that means they're feeling good. And they're looking forward to Brian and Diana talking next. So that's exciting. Why did you decide to attend this event? And I want to learn new things. And I'm sure Brian is going to tell you about those new things. And finally, a fun hand on the heart. And I, wow, 32 of them, 68% are wearing pajamas right now. Exciting. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing that and we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna introduce Brian to you uh, quickly. So Brian is a program director at the Urban Technology Program at University of Michigan's Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. 
He's a co-founder and partner at Dash Marshall, a design and strategy studio. Uh, he's also the Ailil, Ailil Serenin Visiting Assistant Professor of Practice. I'm sorry if I actually did not know how to pronounce that right. <laughs> uh, Brian has received his bachelor's in fine arts from uh, Rhode Island Institute of Design and his master's in architecture from Harvard Graduate School of Design, but we're only talking about Michigan today. So welcome, Brian. Thank you. Thanks for having me as well. Uh, and it's nice to join everyone. Uh, I have many fond memories of traveling and, and working in India. I was actually there for about a month last year, uh, working with Infosys, training the new batch of, of uh, Infosys team members down in Mysore. And so um, just really fond of those experiences and, and very excited to, to share more about the program that we're working on here. So I'm going to go ahead and share some slides here. Um, the University of Michigan uh, created a new Bachelor of Science in Urban Technology, which is a chance for us to recognize the way that the world has shaped uh, or changed today. So think about um, the most important challenges in front of us, things like climate change, public health, do those involve cities? Can we solve those challenges without thinking about cities? Can we solve those challenges or hope to have some kind of positive impact on those challenges without understanding and using technology in some way? So the answer I would put forward is no. Both the, the fundamental nature of the most pressing things in front of us are both urban and demanding of a response at scale, right? We can't just make stuff work for a few people, a few hundred thousand people here, a few hundred thousand there. We need to operate on the scale of millions and billions of people to improve lives for everyone. And so what that means is that we need to understand technology and we need to be able to apply it in, in places like cities. And so the Bachelor of Science is a way for us to uh, train and, and build a cohort of people who excel at doing that. So if we, if we get into this, um, Duval had the great idea of having a bit of a project during the discussion. And so um, I will actually let me stop this because the slides are malfunctioning. That's a little fun. Um, and one second here. Uh, so Duval had the idea of having a workshop uh, during this session. And so what I want to do is introduce you to Ruth Ann. This is my great aunt. Okay. So Ruth Ann is 90 years old. She lives in San Francisco by herself and she doesn't have great eyesight. If you look really carefully, down at the bottom of the screen, just above the words lives alone, you'll see a magnifying glass that she uses to read everything. So the question for you, and I want you to think about this during the presentation, and then uh, at the end, we'll have a, a bit of a discussion. It's a very simple question. What technologies could help Ruth Ann? And you can interpret that however you want. That might be uh, some kind of app, that might be some kind of device. Uh, you know, imagine it'd be hard for her to use a cell phone, for instance, if she has poor eyesight. So what else could we do to help her? That might be something completely different, right? So think about Ruth Ann, think about your own elders and how we might help them, even though they're not the typical person that we think of when we start talking about technology, right? Uh, uh, Nihal's workspaces probably are not filled with people who are 90 years old. I'm just guessing, but uh, it would be cool if they were. So if we get into it, what is urban technology? And if you search the web, you'll see images like this, okay? So what is going on here? There's kind of Death Star looking thing. There's wires flying through the sky. It's a generic cityscape. We don't know 
where that is, if that's Tokyo or, or Boston or London or what, that's not really interesting to us because we don't know what it is. Okay, so then we also see pictures like this, right? The world is yours, it's on a platter. And there are some uh, apps and, and things floating up above. This also is pretty meaningless, right? So that doesn't really help us either. So the way that we define urban technology is that it's that which helps us see, shape, or inhabit cities in new ways, okay? So what does that mean? We see cities in new ways by using data to create maps and visualizations that we've never had before because it was simply too difficult or took too much time to put together. So for instance, this is a view of Amsterdam and all of the green are individual trees that have been mapped by using computer vision to look at Google Street View. And what it tells us is the percentage of tree cover in the city. And when we automate that, it allows us to compare the level of tree cover in a place like Amsterdam versus Mumbai, for instance. Or not only that, to think about one neighborhood in Mumbai versus another neighborhood in Mumbai. And now what does that do? That helps us understand where we wanna make investments, right? Where do we wanna improve the public realm? Uh, for instance, to introduce more shade and help reduce the kinds of uh, urban heat island effects that happen in cities. Shape. Shaping is easier, it's more clear. Uh, this is about building the city. And so we imagine now that today, uh, you know, there are laborers with hammers and very traditional methods, but actually construction is changing. The tools that we use to build are changing. We increasingly use robots, we use laser levels, things to get a very precise control over the built environment, and also to build buildings much faster. You know, if you've ever passed a construction site, even with tens or hundreds of people, it's so slow. And that means it's so expensive. And so what we're looking for are ways to change how we shape the city so that we can make the city, again, more equitable, more enjoyable, more sustainable, better for everyone. And then inhabit. To inhabit the city means simply to live, right? And so when we think about the types of services, like Nihal mentioned Squiggly, Uber, et cetera, they're changing the way that we move, we eat. Uh, they're changing how the cities that we already have live and breathe. And so the question is, what will come in the future? Will we be getting our dosas delivered by robots? Will we be getting our groceries delivered by portable vending machines? Will we be using new forms of power like renewable energy and that requires battery storage like these Tesla devices? Will we be working in new ways, right? Like Nihal mentioned with WeWork and, and their many innovative offerings. And so then I think the next question that's important here is who creates urban technology? If you study this kind of material, what can you do? So of course there are companies, all the big ones, right? Amazon, Google, WeWork, Katera, Sidewalk Labs, Uber, Grab, da 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 we could go on for a long time. If you wanna go work in a big, exciting tech company, they're all touching the city in some way today. But what's also important to know is that it's not just those companies that are doing this work, right? You don't have to be a hardcore engineer to do this work. There's also, for instance, local and national governments like the Smart Cities Initiative in India that began some years ago. And many other places have similar efforts. And so it takes smart people inside government. It also takes smart people at think tanks and academic research institutions uh, for us to understand what's going on. So it's not just about building the technology, but also about imagining it and um, and putting it together in a more holistic way. So when we ask the question then, what are the kinds of people doing that? Again, software engineers, sure. Mechanical engineers, sure. Electrical engineers, 
We could name a thousand different kinds of engineers and they're all involved and the best engineers are all coming from India today, right? It's amazing how many Indian engineers I've had a chance to work with. We're also though looking at the role for designers and business people, or more importantly, let's rephrase that. People who understand what we should be building, not just how to make it happen. Because the most important question today is what do we do? right? That's the hardest thing to answer. What should we do? And once we figure out what to do, then we have tons of skill to make it happen. So the program that we're developing is focused on that what question. So what's wrong with this picture that we looked at before? Well, it's quite simple. What's missing are people, right? The image on the right is just lines and buildings who wants to live there? Maybe nobody even lives there. The only way we can tell that there's any kind of life in that image on the right is that we see some lights on here and there. So that's not good enough. We need to think about cities for people like the picture on the left. And to do that, we need to understand cities, of course. We also need to understand technology, how people use it and how it comes together. And we need to understand design because design is the skill set that we use to imagine new futures. So the goal here is that if you study urban technology at the University of Michigan, you will emerge being able to see cities through data, like the Amsterdam example with the trees that we showed. You'll understand how to shape cities through code, how to make technology that changes the way that we build cities and you'll be able to design positive change, right? None of this matters unless the things that you do actually improve, improve life for people like Ruthie and your elders and your neighbors and yourself. And so that's the goal. To do that, yes, we need to understand and think about things like smartphones and GPS and broadband and machine learning and apps and all of that. But we also need to understand people, culture, history, politics, the soft stuff that's usually left out of an engineering curriculum. And so the Urban Technology Bachelors of Science is combining the technical, hard, quantitative stuff with the soft, qualitative human stuff, okay? So if we think about it, you know, cities, this is a question of history, ultimately, right? Do we know cities as complex systems? Do we know the story of the people, the story of the culture and the history of cities? Code is about understanding the technology from a hardware and software perspective. And it's very simple. How do we put it together, right? How do you make sense of something like what's on the screen here? Design is about inventing new concepts and ideas like these students who are in a workshop uh, collaborating around the table. What we're putting together, the program is collaborative. It's uh, based on quick and light prototyping, right? So we start out with the most fast and at hand means. So for instance, this is an image from the workshop that I taught in Mysore and the student is imagining a new smartphone. Well, he didn't go and make some actual smartphone. He just used a piece of paper to, to show what the kind of interaction or the interface might look like. And all that did was spark a conversation so that we could evolve that idea and make it better. Same thing with this, right? This is looking at a, a VR goggles uh and i don't even remember the whole story but it has a kind of trunk down the middle that i think um, protected him from the smell of his neighbors while he was using the vr on the bus what we're looking at is we want people to not only be able to do things quick and light but also be able to work with precision like the woman drawing on the screen here at another one of our workshops last year at the university of michigan we want you to have fun Right, so of course, going to college, getting your bachelor's degree, it's an important step in your life and your career, 
Uh, but it's not just about advancing your career. It's not just about making your parents happy. It's about you stepping into a fulfilling life. And that means you have to enjoy it. And we really want this to be an experience that is collaborative, collective, and fun. So let's think about just as some closing thoughts here, um, how you might apply a degree like this. So, you know, we're not imagining that overnight cities are going to turn into some kind of high tech experience and things like the marketplace disappear. That's, that's not it. If you think about today, you probably have a smartphone. You might also still have a normal calculator in your house. You have simple technologies like indoor plumbing, right? Imagine, think about two generations back, even one generation back for some of us, how happy our family would be to have indoor plumbing and how for taken for granted we sometimes treat things like that or like electricity, right? And so the, what that tells us is that technology doesn't get replaced. We just add new layers on top, right? So we have some of the oldest and most basic experiences like a, a central market, like the Mysore market here from my travels last year. Uh, but we also have smartphones. We also have delivery robots. We also have the internet. And so we're thinking about layers. So what are the layers of technology that we might add to a market? What are the layers of technology that might help us imagine the future of retail, the future of shopping? What about mobility, how we move around cities? What will that look like? What about the library or other important places around town? How would you make the library more supportive, more engaging, more of a platform for learning the way that you want to do it, not just the way that somebody thought you might want to do it? What about food, right? Food is so important to us as humans and so important to the culture of our many diverse cities. How do we think about the future of food in those places? And how can technology help us imagine and interact and experience food in new and exciting ways? And ultimately it comes down to this, one simple thing. Will this future that we build, that the engineers put together, that the designers and business people imagine and shape in collaboration with those folks that you design after you graduate from the University of Michigan with a Bachelor of Science in Urban Technology, will that world that you create be a dystopia or a utopia? Will it be terrible or amazing? And that question is up to you. So I'm gonna put this URL on the screen. We'll also make sure that there's a URL that goes into the chat so it doesn't get lost. So uh, please, if you have any questions about the program, you of course have the Q&A today, but there's also a link here to the website with more information on it. But let's come back to Ruthie, my great aunt, uh, or people like her who are quite senior and they live alone. And like humans do, they have their own challenges. Ruthie's is poor eyesight. Uh, others have different challenges. And maybe Deval, just ask, um, how are we doing on time here? Because I know we had a, just a certain amount of time set aside for the exercise. Right. I, I think we do have some uh, plenty of time, um, Brian. And, and this was, this was uh, incredible. I think, you know, the presentation that you made, and, and I, I do want dosas made quickly like that. You know, I mean, I, who, who wants dosas like that? I mean, I, you know, if I ask people to put their hands up, I'm sure I'm going to find at least 70% of them wanting that. Um, and yeah. No one wants it more than me, frankly, because it's very hard to find a dosa in Detroit. I have to travel for 45 minutes to a decent place. Well, you know, I was actually going to ask um, even Nihal about the fact that, you know, what's his favorite memory of Michigan? And, you know, what's the food place that he would go to um, if, if, you know, he had the opportunity to do that? Oh, I think my, my favorite... Uh, uh, experiences have been just living on campus, moving around the campus. I think the campus was so beautiful, the South Campus area. 
Uh, we used to live, we used to live on campus as well as off campus uh, during a few semesters, right? Right. And, and just moving around there, going to Duda Start, sitting in the sitting in the library there, you know, uh, has been amazing. I think uh, I, I still, I still vividly remember some of those the spaces in the library. Uh, um, so yeah, some very good experiences there. Wonderful. So Brian, I think we're fine on time. I think we have about um, another 20, 25 minutes and we have about 15 minutes for Q&A in, in between that. So I think you have another 10 minutes, I would say, um, to sort of complete the workshop. And, and you know, um, if you want to ask students any questions so that they can send their responses on the on the chat, you could probably go ahead and do that. Yeah. So let's just say, let's just throw this open and uh, people can put any kind of message you want any fragment of an idea or a question mark or whatever it is in response to this uh, question that's on the screen, right? So we'll open the chat and then as people are responding in the chat, uh, we'll pull some of those ideas up and, and talk through them. Great. So um, what what would you want to, uh, is there anything specific that you want to ask them that, that they want to respond to in particular at this point? Yeah, well, so it's a really broad question on purpose, right? Because when we think about inventing what comes next, there's no pathway, there's no guideline. So, you know, as, as Nihal was talking about WeWork, uh, transforming the way that we think about real estate, right? And then having to do it again in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Nobody sat down and said, hey, here's what you do next. You rethink how you can support education, right? You guys had to make that up on your own from scratch. And so the question here is what technologies could help Ruthie? <laughs> and that's very broad. So for instance, in the chat, I'm seeing uh, from Akshay a suggestion about a smart fireplace, which could be having a temperature sensor and perhaps um, light up when the temperature goes lower than a particular amount, right? And it could have, uh, she could also have audio books which might entertain her or perhaps a robot might help her with her medicines. Like these are great ideas. It's, it's what I'm hearing in that is uh, how does she interact with the environment, right? So if she's not going to be able to read anything on a tiny screen, how do we use colored lights in the room to help her get some information from the environment. And then, for instance, the fireplace, that's a, uh, if you, that's quite different than interacting with just the buttons on your screen, but it's really exciting because that starts to change the whole space around her by warming the whole space. And actually you can see in this image in the bottom right corner, she has a little heater there uh, because she's trying to keep warm. It, it can be quite chilly in San Francisco. I, I would I would also go I would also go with hey Siri, that's one thing I would say, and yep. um, hey because she needs that support and help if her um, you know she has poor eyesight she needs someone that's going to support her so you know um, either it's going to be Siri or it's either going to hey I said hey Siri and my phone started off okay yeah 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 I mean this is a, lining up uh, Deval with some of the comments in the chat this is awesome to see stuff flowing in. Alexa is, is uh, described, uh, voice enabled text to speech eyeglasses. I love that idea. You put on glasses and whatever you point them at, uh, she would be able to hear through an audio prompt. And yeah. you know, what that brings up is um, people who are elderly, like Ruthie is, you know, she's used to being able to navigate the world, right? And not have to rely on others or not have to rely on devices and technology to help her. But as she gets older, she finds that she needs more and more help. And so I'm sure you've seen it with, with your own family. And, and sometimes it can be hard to help your grandparents or, or your elder members because they want to do it themselves, even though they can't really see very well or they can't really hear very well. And so what's interesting about having eyeglasses that would uh, help read words in front of you is that you could still pick something up that you know has the information that you need on it and it could tell you what you're seeing there, right? Without having to um, ask somebody uh, to read it for you, for instance. So let's, let's look at some other- Yeah, I, I think there's some interesting um, solutions here. 
Nihal, mm -hmm. you've seen anything in the chat that you are excited by? What should we pick up and, and talk about next? Well, this is chips in the brain. That's the you know yeah. one of the you know that Elon Musk is doing. What what do you think about that? I think that's that's very interesting. The, the whole the whole idea around Neuralink, that uh, and I love the demo the demonstration that he had put together uh, with the three. I, I, you know, pers personally, I thought it was scary. <laughs> it's it's interesting, right? Try to like operate on my brain and then try to put a chip in there. I think that's just telling me that the machines are going to take over pretty soon. But I don't know. What do you think, Brian? Uh, you know, if you think about it, we've had for a long time, there's always some technology that's going to take over, right? And it, it, it rarely happens. And when it does happen, it's much slower than anybody thought it would be. So if you think about cars, just plain old petrol powered passenger cars that are filling our cities and have filled our cities beyond capacity. Tons so, of tons of traffic, right? Those cars started here in Michigan. The, yeah. the first commercial vehicle started here a hundred years ago, over a hundred years ago. And we, the, the scientists now, the predictions are that we're basically at the peak cars globally. The most number of cars we'll ever have on earth exist right now or maybe in the next 10 years or so. And then we'll see a decline as we start using things like autonomous mobility. But so what that tells me is if we got in a time machine and we went back 100 years, people would be saying, the new car is going to change everything tomorrow. And yet it took 100 years to play out, right? So I, I, I am quite uh, cautious when we talk about things like Neuralink or these because we're seeing glimmers of what will change, but the change again happens in layers, not as a as a complete like from from A to B, right? It's it was red yesterday, now it's orange. It's not like that. We end up with all the colors, and so that's actually makes it much harder. Like think about the Dosa robot. Yeah, that Dosa robot works perfectly fine. Well, it works decent. It can still get confused and lost. But if you're in a city like Ann Arbor with perfect, pristine sidewalks and the snow is shoveled regularly, it's okay, right? But what about if you're in a place where the sidewalk isn't so well taken care of? That robot can't get to you. So that robot is irrelevant in a certain way. And so part of the work that we need to be doing in the next 10 years 15 years or e actually even next one year uh, and, and onwards from there is about taking some of these glimmers that we're seeing now like autonomous cars like delivery robots like ai and siri and these kinds of things that all kind of work right like siri and alexa they do a lot but they're still not perfect and how do we develop those so that they work for more people in more situations more reliably because I might try to say, hey, Siri, you know, order me some food or get me an Uber or whatever. Ruth Ann, Ruthie on the screen here, she doesn't have the patience for it. Yeah. And so we're missing billions mm -hmm. of people because they're not being addressed. They're, the technology is being designed for a very specific group of people who frankly look more like me and have more backgrounds more like me uh, and we're not thinking about people who are, for instance, elderly or have other health issues or people who don't have the same kind of economic status and therefore kind of locked out or, or find it difficult to participate. And so this, again, is exactly why the focus for the program is on thinking about technology from a much broader, more humanistic perspective. So it's not just the engineering questions about how to build things, but it's also about what we should build and who we should build things for. And that's very interesting the way you put it, um, you know, Brian, because I feel that that is so true. You know, there's a lot of technology which is not accessible, right? It's not commercially accessible. And I think that makes it more difficult. So when you look at it in this perspective, um, I'm, I'm very excited. I'm very excited about a program like this that would actually allow you, um, you know, to see a lot of change. Um, and, and maybe if you want, you could talk about some of the uh, you know, because I know the, the, you know, the program sort of starts in winter. 
And um, then I think you have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of things in, in the mix, you know, it's not just studying all the time. Um, <laughs> it okay. is studying all the time, but we'll also do other things with the studying. <laughs> right. I know. I, 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 you know, it's, it, well, it's Michigan. You're going to study all the time. And that's a given. Um, yeah. This thing, there's, there's fun, right? There's fun. There's, uh, you know, activity that you could do outside. Um, maybe you, if you want to talk about what, what's in store, is there, you know, um, something else that the students are going to get to do outside? Um, you know, if you have ideas like this, do you have a lab that you can experiment? What is it going to be like? Yeah, so the, the nature of the program uh, is collaborative and hands-on as much as possible, right? So yes, you will study history. Yes, you will have lectures in classrooms. Uh, and we try to keep across the University of Michigan, the classroom size relatively small. Um, we try to keep it uh, uh, interactive, right? So even if you have a big lecture, you'll then have a conversation afterwards in a small group so that we can process what we learned. The, the projects that we do are what is most exciting for me, right? So in, in design, it's very common that if we wanna think about something like how to help a person like Ruthie, first we go out and we do a bunch of research, right? So we might go talk to elderly people, people who are, have similar kinds of conditions to her. We might talk to people who are not elderly, but also have vision challenges to try to understand, you know, more of the um, kind of context that she's dealing with. I saw one of the messages in the chat was about data, yeah. right? So we might, for instance, use some public data sources like the census, which is a survey of all of the people in the US to understand how many people are there like Ruthie. What does that tell us? That gives us a sense of how much potential there is in the marketplace, right? If we wanted to make a business creating one of these ideas that we talked about in the chat, how many potential customers are there? Is it even worth it for us to try to do something from a financial perspective? But if we flip that and think about it from a policy point of view, right? Maybe it's not actually about making money. Maybe it's about making life better for people or for saving society money by bringing preventative care. And so there, the data analysis is also hugely important because again, it helps us understand the scale uh, of the issue. So once we do the research and, and we start understanding maybe what the opportunities are and understanding maybe some of the challenges in, in more detail, then we go into a mode of brainstorming. And so you saw some of the images uh, in, in the slide presentation of people you know, making the paper smartwatch or the VR goggles or doing drawings and stuff like that. And those are all scenes from different workshops uh, or parts of courses that we've run that are an opportunity for people to work together to say, you know, what do we think might be relevant here? And it's similar to what we've just had in the chat. Like it, it honestly starts from zero, from scratch, just throwing ideas out. But eventually, you know, you start to hear something that might be compelling. And then we need to develop that and nurture that and grow that as an idea, make it more refined. And so, you know, having um, great design faculty people who know the history of cities and urban challenges. We have an amazing policy school at the University of Michigan. We have an amazing school of information and college of engineering. So the benefit of a place like the University of Michigan is that it's, it's so large, frankly, and so strong across many different areas that if you as an individual student get really excited about some micro area. Uh, you know, if you're super interested in water quality, right? And that's the thing that you wanna, you wanna get into, or you're really passionate about social justice. Uh, and that's the thing that you want. Like you can go and take classes in that with your peers uh, in studying other topics on campus. You can go and speak with the professors and learn from them directly. And so what we're trying to do is create a kind of crucible where students not only have access to the other resources on campus, but they have a reason 
to be going after and pursuing those diverse interests, right? And the reason for it is because they're not sitting in a classroom trying to uh, learn some rote memorization of history, but they're trying to solve real problems or, or think through real problems today. And so what we hope what that gives them is a kind of passion to, as we'd say, pound the pavement on their own, right? And, and do the work to figure out who they need to talk to and go do it and then come back and, and bring their experiences to the, the projects. Oh, this is incredible. You know, it just it just reminds me, and, and before I move on and, you know, also introduce Diana, because I'm sure she has a couple of slides there and we have another uh, 10, maybe 15 minutes. Uh, but I really want to talk about the fact that I, I, I remember one of the classes that I loved when I was in Michigan was law and economics, because I was an economics and computer science major. And, you know, when I actually went into that class for law and economics, it really allowed me to understand, um, you know, how the whole um, tort system sort of works, right? Because uh, we had this case study, I sort of remember about McDonald's and how they're actually making sure that their coffee is not more than a certain degree in terms of, you know, um, how hot it, it's supposed to be. Because someone sued McDonald's because they had third degree burns. And... Um, it's incredible to see that, you know, you learn so much from uh, courses that allow you to uh, sort of combine this. And, and Michigan has 19 schools. Um, it's, it's incredible to see how you could make friends from like, you know, the law school to economics and LSNA and public policy and the medical school. It's it, it could just go on. And, and so you're right, you know, Brian, I think it's um, it's amazing. And I think we've already seen a lot of questions coming in. And, and before we, we continue to them, I want to introduce um, uh, Diana. And thank you so much, Brian. I think this is this is wonderful. I think um, it's so promising to see the kind of work that you're doing. Um, you know, I, I love your background, by the way. You know, it's, it's, it's nice. It's open. Um, you know, you can see your windows and some drawings at the back. Uh, thank you for sharing that personal space of yours uh, with us. And um, um, introducing Diana, um, you know, I spoke to her briefly on the dry run. Uh, welcome, Diana. Um, she's the admissions officer for Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. Um, she is a specific admissions license to the Bachelor of Science degree in Architecture and Bachelor of Science in Urban Technology. Um, Diana has several years of recruiting admissions experience. She graduated from Taylor University in Upland, Indiana, where she earned a degree in public relations. Over to you, Diana. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to note by saying that a lot of this information on these slides are specifically for students that are going to be graduating this year. So I'll be talking a little bit about how that works for those of you who are juniors right now in 11th grade. Um, so this next year, this group of students that are seniors right now, this program is specifically for you. So it is a winter 2022 start. So what that means is that you would be applying um, this year for then that next year start. Um, so actually, we can go on to the next slide here. So for those of you who are in 12th grade right now, the application is open to you. The regular decision deadline is February 1st. Um, and then the program start date wouldn't be until January of 2022. So how that works is that you'd be taking, um, you wouldn't be taking courses within that fall semester. We'd have other ways of engaging you through that. And then you would actually start in the winter term. Um, so that is a little bit different than maybe most of you have heard of doing things. But um, then for those of you who are juniors, um, your application would then open up August 1st of this coming year, 2021. Some of the pieces that we need, these are all listed on the University of Michigan website as well as our website. Um, if you go to admissions.umich.edu, which I'll put this down in the chat as well so you guys have that, all of this information is on there as well. Um, one thing to note that is different for us than from other schools um, at the University of Michigan is that we are not requiring the ACT or SAT. Um, that is currently for this, this year, but it's probably gonna be going forward as well. Um, partially due to coronavirus, partially due to um, us not necessarily seeing the benefit of having it compared to some of the other pieces. We don't want it to hold a student back from applying. So these are the different pieces that we're going to need from you in order to have a complete application. Um, you can do either the coalition or the common app. 
And then all of these pieces, you'll have a, an online platform where you're then able to um, check to make sure you have all the pieces in so that you have a complete file. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, and, you know, I was going to ask, uh, there are two questions which I have, you know, right on my mind in terms of um, which I could see some of the students also want is, one is what, how many number of students are you looking at, you know, for the first program? Um, you know, that's a good question just to kind of lay it out there, um, you know, let them understand, maybe they understand how competitive the program is going to be. Um, so that'd be great to know as the first question. Yeah, I mean, partially that'll have to do with how many of you end up applying. Um, so we are kind of just open to seeing how many students are applying. And then from there, we're hoping to have upwards of 50 students. We're not sure if we'll have actually have that for our first year program, um, but that's what we're shooting for. Great, thank you. Um, and also, I think a question that I had is, um, um, and this might be something that Brian also can um, kind of tell us about is, um, I know that, you know, Michigan has um, a separate department that actually takes care of a lot of, um, you know, um, innovative content that could even go onto Coursera, for instance. Um, and I, I think I saw a lot of them actually asking about the fact that they really want to participate in urban technology. Are you thinking of having a small little course that probably could be put up on Coursera or something like that that introduces them, um, you know, to this concept, which is, which is really going to make it more easier for them to really, you know, kind of a short course or something that allows them to understand that this is something that they would want to pursue. Uh, yes, just as soon as I perfect my cloning machine and I make uh, a small army of people will be doing a Coursera short course. Uh, oh, I know it's 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 a tough one. <laughs> tough job. Yeah, no, so the the um, we we are working on creating more ways to connect with the program that's for sure uh but it's a it's a new thing right so this is exciting because it's the first time that we're offering this degree um and and that means i just want to be honest with people that that means you know there are things like a coursera uh, course that you could learn to dip your toe in the water and that would be awesome to have, but we don't have it yet. So it, it's it's evolving in conversation, and uh, that's why we wanted to to come and, and join you for this discussion, right? Because I think it's it's good for people to um, be able to see more than what's on the website. So, right, right, no, absolutely. Um, and uh, there's a really good question that we have with Abhishek that says that I'm a third year um, um, undergraduate product design student. And he's saying Mr. Robert had mentioned about how Indian engineers are one of the best in the world and how designers and business men collaborate with engineers to create urban technology. What is your opinion um, in a, opinion is the scope of an Indian product design graduate wanting to pursue urban planning um, in postgraduate? So if he wants to do that because he's already an undergraduate student uh, there's a question which he has um, is does this program probably lead to uh, you know or is it is going to lead to a master's program at a later point yeah well uh, we're not going to make any commitments right now for a master's in this uh, urban technology area but what I will say is for instance at the University of Michigan uh, you can do a master's in urban planning and you can complete a certificate in urban informatics which focuses more on the C um, kind of data analysis and, and using computational methods to see cities. Um, that's one way with the current offerings that we have that you could participate at a master's level or postgraduate level uh, at the University of Michigan and, and still work on some of these topics. Great. And, and um, one of the questions uh, which I feel is important for, I think, everyone here is that what, what kind of a background are you going to look at for a student? Um, so the interest is important, I'm sure, for the program, but um, what kind of a background would you typically want the student to have um, as maybe a prerequisite for the program? Or, um, you know, um, what kind of a student do you really want for this program? Yeah. So what we're looking for are two things, and they're very broad. The first is we want to know that you care about something, that you're passionate. 
And so that might be you're passionate about your neighborhood or a club that you're part of or history or whatever it is. But we want to know that you really genuinely care about something and that you have an interest in making the world better, not just making yourself rich or becoming famous or you know something like that. And the second is that, that you bring your own creativity to your work. And so that doesn't mean that you need to be an amazing portrait artist, right? Or a beautiful photographer or whatever. You can be creative in writing. You can be creative in the way that you do performances. You can be creative just in how you think about things, right? A unique perspective that you bring to your essays or your other work. And so we're looking for a, a general sense of creativity uh, that allows you to, to see the world or, or approach the world in an interesting way. So we want to know you care and we want to know you're creative. Great. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, I think that um, there's, there's um, any questions which, um, you know, are particular to admissions, um, you know, which I see particularly that students here would have is, um, uh, you know, considering that we've had or we've seen um, most of the schools kind of closed and the exams kind of get delayed from time to time, um, are they specific uh, sort of, you know, academic requirements that you're going to look at in case if some of their grades are low? Um, or, uh, you know, because they're studying online, um, there might be a concern in certain ways. I mean, um, you know, how are you thinking of sort of measuring them? Because, you know, some of them might be facing that kind of a, a challenge in this last eight to 10 months. So l let me try to answer or begin answering this. And then Diana, uh, you chime in as well, please. And uh, Diana will, will know in much more precision than I do because these details are not my specialty. So we have uh, basic uh, course requirements that high school students must complete. And then we are not looking at test scores this year uh, because of the, the testing difficulties that we've had with testing centers closed and, and things like this. Um, I believe, Diana, you can step in uh, for our international students. What are the additional requirements? Yeah, um, I mean, the biggest thing would be either taking the TOEFL or the IELTS, um, just because we want to make sure that, um, like, the English language learning level is up there. Um, but other than that, yeah, the, the minimum course requirements are, like, four years of an English course, um, three years or more of math, three or more years of a natural science, and then three or more years of a social science within in your studies. And then we're also looking for things outside of that as well. It's not just the things that you're doing in a classroom. Um, we're looking to see in your essays and different things like that, how, how you've been engaged, how you've been involved. Obviously, that's gonna be a little bit different if you were just going based off of this past year. Um, but we're looking at a lot of different things. It's definitely a holistic review it's not just one thing that we're holding on to. But since we don't have the opportunity to do anything like um, an interview, having the opportunity to learn more about you through your essays is definitely important. Uh, more important than just looking at a transcript and saying, oh, they took these classes and, and these are the specific grades that they got within them. Don't get me wrong, that is important, but it's not like the only things that we're looking at. Okay, I also have a question, and there are two of them actually here that I could see. One is saying, if I'm a B-grade student, but I won a RoboWar competition last year, what is my probability of getting in? Now, I know that's a very open-ended question, but I think we can have some fun here. Um, so maybe if you want to go for that, Diana or Brian, I'll leave that up to you. Um, the answer I'll give you is probably not the answer you want, uh, mysterious person A in the chat, which is we, we never know until you try, right? So, uh, of course, there are people who've dropped out of college and yet they've done amazing things. So, you know, at the end of the day, we're looking at the, the big picture, right? All of your experiences and your qualifications put together. And that's how we approach admissions, right? It's, um, you know, look, honestly, 
if you said, I'm a D student, but I won Robo Wars, I would say, you're not going to get in. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. But a B student is still a good student, right? I know everybody wants to be perfect, perfect, but a, a B, you should be proud of having a B because that might mean that you're doing other things like the robot competitions and stuff. So that, that's perfectly fine, but we can't like really address those questions because we just don't know enough about you. And so the application process is designed to give us more ways to uh, learn about your experience your strengths and and then ultimately we need to look at all of the applicants and and build just a pool you know a, a cohort of people that together are going to be strong i'm also seeing questions about physics physics is not required um, we require three years of math um, so again this is it's not a, a engineering heavy course you will be doing some coding and engaging in some of those issues but um, we're not expecting you to have really uh, deep uh, math and, and hard science skills. Great, fantastic. Um, also, I think there was a question about if there are any scholarships. I know international students at the undergraduate level seem to be a little bit more challenging, but um, if you have anything that you would like to discuss, please do so. Not necessarily anything specific, um, but there is the possibility with creating a new program. Um, it's kind of up in the air what those specifics look like. We do have um, merit-based scholarships for our undergraduate students right now who are participating in architecture. So I would like to assume that that is also gonna be happening for, for urban technology as well. Brian, I don't know if you have anything else extra on that. Uh, okay. That's it, yeah. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I know that there is uh, still a questions about creative portfolio for admission. Do I need to like have a portfolio of something? Um, okay, no. So I could see Diana saying no, there's not a need. There's something on subject requirements, which I think Brian just went through that you don't need physics in particular, but math is important. Um, but I think that that kind of answers most of the questions that you know I've seen. And I think we're almost at the end of our, our time. Um, but um, yeah, I think this has been a fantastic session. Um, anything, Diana and Brian, you want to talk about um, the School of Architecture and Urban Planning? Anything specific on terms of the campus or just give them an idea of what it sort of feels like being there? Um, or if you have a picture of it and, um, you know, I, I, you know I, I think my memory of, of Michigan is so much of being at the ugly, being at the Diag, being on North Campus, because I was computer science and then economics as well. So, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of ferried myself from, you know, all those, uh, you know, from the North Campus down to Central. And then I, you know, I, I lived at the, um, you know, at the dorms uh, in North Campus. And then I came down to Central Campus. And, I mean, it's it's been such an amazing experience, um, you know, being on campus at Michigan. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't even know where to start, how incredible that feeling is. Um, and, and of course, football. Um, I know, you know, the, the virus has just made it very difficult, um, you know, in some ways this year. But I think I'm so happy to hear that we have the vaccine coming out. And, um, you know, um, hopefully that's going to, you know, provide a solution in the next six months for all of us um, in some ways. So um, exciting looking for that. Um, but yeah, if there's any memories or, or anything that you want to talk about the School of Architecture, um, you know, that's probably the last thing that we could talk about before moving ahead or concluding. I mean, the main thing that I would want to say is that we are up on North Campus. So if you look at a map of the campus, there are technically three different campuses. Um, South Campus is more of the athletic side of things and Central Campus is where most things are. But up on North Campus, you're also surrounded by um, School of Music, Theater, and Dance. We're actually in a building that's attached to the art school. Um, engineering is also up on North Campus. So there are a lot of things that are up on North Campus um, that are a little bit more specific. So, yeah. Great, fantastic. I know it gets cold in winter, but I think that's a lot of fun after the first winter. Um, so, I mean, I would say it's, you know, for me, it's just go blue. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, I think this is some great, um, you know, questions. And I know Brian's been answering a lot of the questions as well. 
Uh, thank you so much, Brian, for doing that. Um, and thank you all the students who participated today. I hope that you've made the most of the session. Um, and, um, you know, um, Dinah's put that, um, put more details about the website. So, you know, um, you guys can sort of um, visit the website as well, and we can send that to you over later. Uh, there's also a feedback form that Deepa has shared, and it would be nice if you uh, all could just fill out the form, let us know how the session went, and if there's any other questions that you might have. Um, but, and also, um, you know, Brian and Diana, if you wanna share your email IDs, um, um, or any email ID, a specific one uh, in the chat box, you could you could actually do that in case if there are any more questions and they could reach out to you. Great, fantastic. Cool, well, I just wanna say from the University of Michigan side, thank you so much to Deval and your team at TNI Career Counseling. Uh, it was also a pleasure to share the session with Nihal uh, and uh, the, see the WeWork perspective. So thank you so much for having us. And you know, we look forward to seeing you alums come visit us at, at some point and also meeting uh, the students who, who hopefully will, will join us. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Diana, Brian, Nihal, Trey. Um, Nihal, if you want to have any last words. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, that was, was, uh, was great uh, having, uh, joining the session here. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And looking at all the ideas that came by from all the students out here. And thanks, Diana. And thanks, Brian. Um, just, just having this conversation really relived and you know, jogged some of my memory at Michigan. Uh, uh, and I, I love I love being here. So thank you so much. Maybe Nihal, you could give the vote of confidence that when you have urban technology majors graduate, you're going to hire them, right? Absolutely. I think <laughs> we, have, we, have, we continue to look for you know uh, uh, very bright, innovative uh, folks, and I can I can I can I can most certainly believe that you know the the school of urban technology would be able to bring bring that to the to the to the, to the tray, right? So absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I, I thank you so much, everyone. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Nihal. And thank you, all the students. Have a lovely weekend ahead. And if you have any more questions, please do get in touch with us. And please fill out the feedback form. Thank you again. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you.